We're going back now. What's up? We got a Buick Envision with uh, little, little stupid quarter windows right here. Worse than the Blazer. I don't know how they keep making them smaller and smaller, but they do. This is basically the Buick Blazer right here. Um, extra windows, but we'll get them done. We're going to be doing 15%. And the factory, the factory glass, man, it's dark. So much darker. I just had a, a comment in the Facebook group. Somebody's asking about 15 all the way around. Like, what would you do? And everybody assumes the factory is 20%. It's not. It's definitely not. It depends on what you're doing. And even on domestic stuff like this, the factory glass metered at 13 to 14%. She's dark. Plenty dark. All right, we got a battery charge on this. We do. Heck yeah. Got the other one charged. Nice. That one's pretty good too. Heck yeah. Chris, what's up? What's up, guys? We got a fair amount of work. Nothing crazy, though. It's a hatch. We're going to spend an annoying amount of time on the quarter windows, probably. <laughs> Big protest. What protest? Is there a protest? Um, when I tint, I sometimes get small smears. Any idea why and will they go away? What film? That kind of helps. Does your film sound like it's making popping sounds and dragging and little like squeaks and stuff? Because that would be why. New York? Oh, I don't know anything about that. It hasn't popped up in my TikTok feed, so I don't know. <laughs> GeoShield. So GeoShield, and it might do some popping and some whatnot. Um, I mean, I'd do a test. It, yeah, it's potential that they could stay. Um, you just want to make sure everything slides okay. I don't have smears when I'm installing, um, but I could see how you could get them. Generally, like anytime I've seen like a light like smear mark or something, it's fine. Um, it hasn't been an issue, and, and, and it should go away. But it depends. It depends. So I'd do like a personal test on your own vehicle. Sounds like you just need um, more soap. Oh, oh, the Trump stuff going on. Oh, yeah, I don't know anything about it other than I've seen headlines five times because we're back to all that kind of fun stuff now. We're going to tint some cars. Let's go. <laughs> Introduce your new employee. I'm the only one here. There is no new employee. All right, let's go. Oh wait, we gotta do this, we gotta do this part. This part, sorry. Yeah, they look like, as I was pulling it in, they look super dumb. Here, I'll show you. Let's get at it. What is, what is this? Oh, maybe not worse. Okay. I thought the other... It's really dark in that edge. I thought they did them just like the blazer. Uh, Cadillac's done it. 
Um, the Blazer's done it. This is another GM thing. Looks like I got a little border, so as long as you go pretty close, look at how, look how dumb these little quarters is. But, man, I'm telling you, ever since I bought this squeegee, Oh, where's my tool belt? Let me go. It's in my tool belt now. This guy. This guy right here. <laughs> it's still <laughs> maybe too big. No, actually, it'll work out great. Oh, I love this thing. I, any excuse to use this now? Oh, it's a good day. Burner account with the five, there's no fog. No, I didn't turn it on yet. You guys think I'm so prepared. Hang on, let me start this up for you. My, my wife and son are filling in for Jack. So I don't want that, like we were live the other day, so I didn't want it going off with him here. I'd probably freak him out a little bit. I don't know, or he might have fun. They're really loud, though, so I just left them off for now. So I'll fire them up for you. All right, let's get some stuff. We need to get some stuff taped. Why is this dirty? Somebody throw this on the ground. Probably, probably Luke threw it on the ground. But burner account, thank you for the five. I signed up for your tinting school in May. Excited to learn from you. Oh, hell yeah, that's awesome. Zombies is coming out. There's no key. There's no key. There's the key. I like the interior of this thing. It looks... Just like an escape, but the interior is cool. How long does carbon film usually last? Well, a good one's gonna have, like you're not gonna have problems. Okay, let's make sure all that stuff is off, we're good. Yeah, like it's you you can't generalize film like that cuz you can have a dyed film that lasts forever and then you could have a ceramic film that fails next week. It's all just in the quality that they use. So, it's a very like when you go to the store, why are there paints that range from like 10 bucks a gallon to like 60-70 dollars a gallon? It's paint. Well, there's differences. Same thing with window tint. You get quality difference. You get some good ones, you get some bad ones. <laughs> no, that, that's exactly that. It's a gold, that is the coolest frigging Christmas tree. That's been in my showroom for a while. And then uh, my son found out about it. I'll, I might fire it up and show you guys. I'll leave it up all year, but my son started playing with it, and then that makes the whole showroom messy. I'll show you why. It is probably the coolest Christmas accessory that you can ever get. It was one of those things that we had to have as soon as we saw it. Yeah, and it's still gonna be winter here through April, so. <laughs> um, I'm, start -o I'm starting window tinting. I wanna know if I should do Pro Classic or Carbon. I only have enough money to do one type of film. Just stick with Pro Classic. Reason being is 
I use Pro Classic. I use one type of film, and if you're only installing one type of film, your real value prop is literally uh, just tinting cars. <laughs> I tint cars. I use good film. If you want, if, if like people are asking about carbon, then yeah, you could you could have it as a differentiator a little bit, but it's so like, dude, I have people calling, asking like, hey, what are your tint prices? And then I give them like my lowest tint price. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Is that ceramic? And it's like, you don't even know what you're asking. <laughs> they're just calling around shopping for ceramic price. It's like, you're not my customer. And then I spit out a ceramic price, and they're like, oh, uh, well, there's other guys doing it for like 300 bucks. And it's like, okay, well, I'm seven, so sorry. So when I was doing mobile tint, we were only installing one type of film. Um, and you just need a workhorse film. You just need a film that's straightforward to work with isn't gonna give you any hassles, looks great. Do you want tint? Yes, here's the price, cool. Let's go. So that's why I'm a big fan of Pro Classic. When you're getting into upsells, you're gonna to wanna to then carry three and then have that heat box demo or just an easy way to explain it which is the heat box demo. Because then you're selling like a, you, you, you have a little ladder thing going on. You're like this is good, this is better, this is best. And then you start talking about the differences between them. You can have Apex, which is the best ceramic, and then still, people wouldn't want to spend any more than whatever amount for it because you just wouldn't have a good way of explaining it in relation to like the other stuff that you're installing. It would just be like, oh, that's just your tint. So I posted in the Facebook group, apparently a guy full ceramic job for a hundred. Oh yeah. Everybody like people talk about hundred dollar tint jobs. And then we saw like last summer, People were posting about like 70 and then somebody was posting about 50 and then there was a next thing you know there's a meme about paying the customers to come in to tint their cars there there is no absolute cheapest you can always go lower and the thing is it's it all anybody thinks when they got a cheaper price is they got a steal on a good product. That's what they think. Oh, I got my car tinted for next to nothing. Like when we were shopping around for stuff for my house, it's like, I, you know, I don't know. We're, we're getting a deck done. I don't know the differences between this one and that one. I know we wanted it to be composite. But I couldn't tell you the difference from one company to the other. And it's not like I have the option to like sample one <laughs> and then sample another. It's like you're going off of pamphlets and what they're telling you. And then eventually it comes down to the difference between like what you feel is an appropriate price to pay for what you're getting. So with window tent, the more examples and the more education that you can give a customer, the better, as long as you don't like overload them. Would a 20 inch roll or 24 be better if you're just trying to start out? No, you get a 36. Okay, I can explain that really well on this car. If you go to 313tint.com, uh, there's a video. Let's see, what what am I? Oh, it is going. It's just very. These are quiet windows. These might be the quietest windows I've ever rolled up. So, 
So 20, 24, 36, and 40, those are going to be the most common sizes. If you're only getting one size, get a 36. 36 is going to cover the vast majority of stuff. Um, you're quickly going to want to pick up 24-inch rolls. Reason being is I might be able to take a 36-inch roll on this and split it in half. Actually, I could. I could take a 36-inch roll, I could split it in half, and I'll have enough uh, that's 18 and 18 to cover both front doors. If you use a 20-inch roll, then you're overlapping a little bit. If you're using a 24-inch roll, you're overlapping a lot. But you need a 24-inch roll when you're doing like F-150 windows. Or you can take a 36-inch roll, you can flip it sideways, and then you have to learn how to shrink on the sides. So you can cover everything with a 36-inch roll. Or most everything. So there's reasons just to have different size rolls. But your first roll, yeah, at least get a 36. That way you know if somebody calls you and has like a car, you'll be able to do the back, you'll have a, a long enough roll to cover the back window. And then you can also split it in half for the sides. But it's not gonna be ideal for every situation. I might have a video. I'm trying to remember if I do. It doesn't happen very often, though. Mostly because I carry 24-inch rolls. I usually do, like, 36 and 24-inch rolls. This is actually a 40, though. Yeah, this is a 40. But if I was doing, like, a RAM... A 36-inch roll would not be tall enough to cover both doors. You'd only get one out of it, and then you'd be left with some extra film at the bottom, unless you flip the roll sideways. And then you'd still be left with some extra film. So with these, you're just basically playing Tetris with the different sizes and stuff and trying to find the happiest balance between getting the most bang for your buck Thirty six. Thirty six will do that in most cases. Unless you just get trucks. If you just get trucks, then twenty fours are fine. If without doing windshields. <laughs> Thanks for the detailed answer, you're welcome. Do you have those temp meters showing IR BLT? Uh, I have a meter that shows VLT. They're, kind, they're a real gimmick uh, for showing IR, except the BTU meters. So if you're just taking a meter and you're putting it over the tint and expecting to get an accurate IR value, you're not really going to get it without spending like $1,000 on a meter. What you're doing is you're getting like a snippet. So light, imagine light is this wide and it's measured in nanometers. So each section is nanometers, it, like it ranges. So the thing is your IR, me, IR wavelength is this wide and what those meters will do is they'll measure a snippet. So they'll measure here, they'll measure here, they'll measure here. But expensive meters will measure the whole band and give you a more accurate reading of what you're actually gonna get. What I think the better thing to do is get a BTU meter and then get a heat box. 
And then you can measure the heat coming off of that lamp and how much that film blocks out. And that is pretty damn accurate to what I actually feel on the car. The best meter is literally put it on your car, sit <laughs> in front of the sun and see what it actually feels like. And then you can like half tint your window and just do them one, of my, one at a time. Like getting a physical number reading doesn't even really do customers any, any benefit. It just makes things confusing. When you start measuring specs of film, it gets really confusing. It, it's like, oh, well, this is like five better than this one. It's like, well, is that actually, like, one, is that real? And two, are you actually going to feel that difference? No, you're not going to feel a five whatever difference between one or the other. You're really just going to feel like the dramatic differences. Good coffee today. I tinted my 23 RAV4 with 15. What should I tint the factory windows on the back? <sighs> so I would put a 35 over the back and see what that looks like. You can just put a piece up on the glass. So a RAV4 is going to meter around like 28%. Um, to best match those, I actually put 35% on the front doors of RAV4s to match the rears. Also, the front glass is way more yellow compared to the rear glass. It's kind of goofy. Like, they're really, like, they're really yellow. So, no matter what, the color is kind of off. So, I actually fixed a, a truck for somebody. They brought it to one shop. They put 20 on the front. It made that color stand out a lot. They said they didn't like it. And then the shop was like, well, that's just what it looks like. And then I actually measured it. And the front windows were about 15% darker than what the rear windows were. And it just made that color stand out way more. So then I, I looked through my films too, because this color was so strong. And I did a 20% carbon and that looked really, really good. Or sorry, 35% carbon. And that looked really good. Matching, matching factory is like, is such a big window tint meme. You, the short answer for most shops is like, oh, let's just throw 20 on it. And a lot of people are fine with that. But every once in a while, every once in a while, you get a customer coming in, back in after you've just done a 20% on the rear and go, hey, why does it look darker? Or why is this not quite matched? And it's like, well, if you want to, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, I'm, I'm game. But it's a long explanation. Is there going to be a slipperier version of tin slip? Yes, there is. We have like new, new, new version coming in. But all this stuff that we've been uh, shipping out has been the stuff that I've been installing. Like, we're, we're making little changes as we go. Um, but I would fully stand behind it to where it is now. But here's the thing. If you're tinting some older vehicles and you spray the glass and the water starts beating off of it, you need to scrub it down before you go to tint it. So, oh yeah, I forgot. I actually have two ounces in my spray tank right now. I'm going from what I had yesterday. Um, I've been experimenting with just different ounces of what I can use. So I was running with three and yesterday I was pushing two. And two I think is pretty good if everything slides okay. Two and a half is probably the sweet spot for me. 
but the so the latest iteration is going to be more helping with those types of situations because I it depends on what you spray it on. I've noticed a lot of older glass tends to just bead off the window a little bit more. So I wanted to make sure that whenever we spray it, it flattens out on those types of surfaces. But the, you're still going to get hydrophobic surfaces that it's going to beat off no matter what. So just trying to figure out a nice in-between. I use like a solid ounce through a 48 spray bottle. Yeah, that's pretty heavy. <laughs> was starting out, what size roll would you recommend? <laughs> Damn it. Literally, like, the first 10 minutes of the stream was talking about roll sizes. Thirty-six, thirty-six 36 and 24s are, like, the best all-around um, roll sizes. You're going to cover all your bases with 36s and 24s. If you do, like, I tend to do more, like, mid-size SUVs and sedans, though. So if you, like, are truck city, then obviously, like, 20s and 24s are both going to be really helpful. 20s I don't find as useful for me, though. I'm trucks. I'm truck city. Yeah, so 20s and 24s are going to be really helpful for you. Cuz Rams you can still cover with a 20. But the new new model uh GM trucks. Those you need a 24 to cover. So both are helpful. It's just if you're trying to squeak those extra inches out of your film. I just said screw it when I was mobile. And like inventory in space, I, I just didn't have extra space in my truck. I only had spaces for two sizes and that was 36 and 24s. but sometimes you'll be wasting too much time <laughs> trying to figure out how to save film rather than just go through it. And it's like, it really doesn't add up to be all that much. But I will say, if you're doing cars uh, in most cases and you're using 20 inch rolls on the sides and then 36 on the back window, it's more comfortable to just use 20 inch rolls on the sides. But you are going to save money if you just use 36s instead over the course of the long term. It's not going to be a ton, but you are going to save some money. That was more for when we were doing like wholesale prices. So we were tinning for like, they would retail it for like 220 and then we would charge them like 170 That was an interesting business.
There we go. Knock it down. Do you have any tips of knowing if a tin shop is good or not? Uh, reviews. <laughs> Unfortunately. Even if you go to an expensive place, just check out their reviews. That That's seriously, like, the best thing that you have to go off of. Because it's not even, like, it's it's so individual. So you can have a bad installer at a good shop and just have, like, a bad time. But at least you would have the sense that if there is a problem, they're going to take care of it and not just brush you off. <laughs> or just ask, are you a good shop? Yeah, right? Just ask them. If you happen to find somebody that likes to post a lot more, like, like seriously, if they have a TikTok and they'll post like behind the scenes and stuff like that, they're just like posting them doing the work, that shows that they care. But reviews, reviews is probably the best indicator. Or if they live stream it, maybe that. Hmm. That too, yeah, referrals. Don't shop around for any particular film. Because the thing is, it, when with film, a shop with a lot of reviews that charge, charges like a standard price, they're going to be using decent films. And are you going to be able to tell the difference from one to another? Not really. No. Not unless you had, like, them side by side. You'll be happy with whatever tier you pick and whatever they put on your car. It really comes down to just the quality of work that they do. And that's going to be just depending on the installer. I'm trying to decide 20% or 15 on my coupe. No windshield tint. Okay, so in most cases, you could put 20 side by side with 15 and not be able to tell a difference. Sounds like you should go with 15 just so you feel a little better. But unless you have a meter to throw over the glass and actually see what's there, like, it's just numbers in your head. Because seriously, I looked at this out in the parking lot, and this looked dark. I was like, okay, I don't know if this is aftermarket tinted or not. Factory glass on this meter is at 14%. There's a lot of them that I'll see in person and I'm like, yeah, that's for sure 35, and I'll put a meter on it, and it'll be like 20. I'm like, oh. <laughs> and I look at it every day. I just do 15. You'll feel better. Do a light windshield tint to make her look. Yeah, if you do a 50, it'll definitely make the car feel darker. 50 is a really, really nice shade. Okay, so that's that one. We're doing 15 all the way around. What am I looking? I'm looking for this stuff. How can I read the comments? I have voices. The voices in my head. And hear the tint prayers. Or I have a robot voice that talks to me. <laughs> uh, 35 or 50 on the shield. That's a real easy one 
Um, I would do 50 on the windshield. If you want a dark look that feels like you're gonna get pulled over, go with 35, it's awesome. But if you want something that you feel like you're not gonna get pulled over for, but still add some shade, get 50. I put 50 on all my windshields, and it's a really nice thing to be able to show customers, but most of my customers lean in the 20% range. So they'll go 20, and then sometimes some of them will go a little darker, or some of them will will do, do a 35 with like a 50% windshield. So most of my clients are not like limo, limo black it out. If it was a lot more of that, we would probably do 35 more often than not, but. This is in such like a weird position. I like have to lean down too much, but it's probably too high for a stool, but we'll see. I just wanna, like this ridge comes down pretty far. I just wanna look up at it rather than like squat down and try and see it. Yeah, this is okay. All right, so again, this is two ounces of tint slip with a, what I would say is a pretty normal new car glass. I wouldn't expect any sticking issues from this anyways and we're using 15% C2. So there's like less reasons for that to stick to. So we'll see how this goes. Oh, and it was sitting in my tank overnight. Looks like it's beating. Or not beating, looks like it's cheating. Anybody ever tell you double five? Mm-hmm. See, I had to read that one. Yeah, and my response is 2%. So there was, a, there was a customer that had a truck. From what I understand, we tinted it in five. And then at some point he had an additional layer put over it. Um, and then they brought in a new vehicle here and they just wanted to go double five on it. And I said, oh, hey, would you want to do 2%? They were very happy with it. It was very dark, but that saves money. And it also gives them the same darkness because it, it's still only one layer of film. You don't hear it like from most companies because most companies um, are sensible. The Tint Depot 2%? Yeah, see, they're a scrappy company. They have an exclusive uh, 2%, both in ceramic and in carbon, and it, uh, yeah, both in ceramic and carbon, and who? it looks good. Sometimes when you go that dark, you, you really start to see, like, you, you have so much color in the film that some of them are really strong in one way or another. It just looked like nice and consistent. It's a really, really good film. I was just hoping that it was going to be dark enough, and they were very happy with it. <sighs> I like that you cover the doors with plastic. Yes, I do it on everything. It's because I got yelled at a lot <laughs> by people that watched videos. 
so, yeah, now we covered door panels. The thing is, very few things actually stick to door panels. Like, even this is starting to come off some. Things just don't stick to door panels. So it's not even like a laziness factor until in a lot of cases. It's just they don't stick. And window tinting is it's auto stuff and you have auto dudes doing it. And it was very it was very like unprofessional for years and years and not e not even like just not unprofessional but in a way it is it's very like mechanic-y. so you, it's you have auto shops selling it you have mechanic type dudes that get into doing the work and so now we're seeing a lot more like oh shops can look fancy now they don't look like just a mechanics garage this is a very new thing. So like doing these extra kinds of steps and dressing up the whole process is like, yeah, I think it's cool. Because we're not getting our hands dirty all day. We're not yanking out your engines. Fan tip or cone tip, which one do you like more? It's a coin flip for me. I would buy the... If I had to only buy one, I would get the cone tip still because it's a little more flexible. But fan tip is great. So I have the cone tip on one side and the fan tip on the other. You'll notice a difference between the two, but they both get the job done just fine. I still gotta do that a little quarter, but see, even this, you do all that, you put aggressive tape and it still starts falling off sometimes. Not a lot sticks to door panels. <laughs> Looks good. I'll do the quarter windows later. Let's just keep going. Roll downs first. I suck at top loading, but thanks for the tips. They were really helpful. You're welcome. Takes a while to learn. I might platter cut the quarters. I do the front quarters, the back ones, and then this back window all together. Use the black trash bag method, it worked good, but left glue, do you use, did good on the back window to remove most of the glue? Would steam have worked better? Uh, not necessarily. A lot of times you get the same effect from a steamer that you get with the trash bag method. Um, and I have way less experience with the trash bag method. It's kind of a crapshoot. Trash bag method is effectively steaming the glass because you're holding hot moisture there against the window. And that's really doing a very similar thing to what holding a steamer there would do, except What's nice about the trash bag method is you can go do something else and let the car work for you. But I still use a steamer because we just don't have sun here. And I still have to remove a lot of glue. Really the biggest goal in removal The biggest goal is just getting the film off the glass because then it's a matter of just scrubbing to get the glue off. But why window tinners really hate removals is because a, a car will come in that got tinted for like a hundred bucks. It'll be blistered and purple. And then that cheap tint job will take hours to remove. And so you're often retinting something twice. You tint it, you do the removal, you put tint on it, and then you still have 
a speck of glue or something that you missed, and then you have to rip it off and do it again. Removals are just terrible all the way around. Wasn't bad, two hours total, nice. I love removals, $125 an hour for removals. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I do similar. I just charge like a blanket price of like 250 for all the sides in the, re in the rear. get very many removals thankfully up here we're a little spoiled we can have bad removals still and sometimes people like to go buy cars out of state and bring them up and then they see my channel and then they want me to tin it and I'm like oh damn it but it's definitely not as excessive as it is down south Down south, you can have a blistered window at every stoplight. Here, eh, it's not, it's not as much. I'm a little spoiled with what I have here. It's pretty nice. I didn't even really realize it until much later. Because I mean, right now, <laughs> you've seen the catalog of stuff we tinted on stream. I have a Buick Envision, like it's new. It's really straightforward. The most I have to bitch about is probably the front quarters on this, and that even isn't very strong. <laughs> so, most of the stuff I have pretty easy going here. I don't have F 150s from like 1990 that have never been taken care of or cleaned, or that live down dirt roads and stuff. But I also charge more than they'd want to pay anyways. Oh. The 15, this is carbon. Uh, it looks really dark because it's going over factory. And the factory meters at 14%. So this is like, this is very dark. Never keep slipping your keg longer than three weeks. I'd agree with that. That's a long time. Starts to stagnate. Yeah, so this is not tinted yet. Just factory. They just said five when they dropped it off. And then I pulled it in and I looked at it. I was ready to just do five over the factory. And I'm like, I don't know if they really know how dark this actually is. Carpet Shield has let me down today. How often do you replace the squeegee blade? Not very often at all. You'll get months of use out of it. Um, it just depends on how hard you go on it. You can also sharpen them and keep using them for longer. So if you start seeing, really it's about just kind of abusing the edge. So if you're running the top of the squeegee 
or the edge of the squeegee over the very top edge of the, the glass, it'll create a line in the squeegee. The hybrids are this nice in-between, though. That's why I really like them. Good material, slides really nice. And you can abuse them a lot more for cleaning without showing wear on the squeegee. Eventually, they'll leave a line, but it'll take a long time to get there in most cases. Do car batteries die on you? Not new cars, not very often. Uh, especially with all the little like shut off features. What they'll do is they'll just start turning off faster and tell you there's low battery. The older cars will just die um, if they have a more abused battery or something. And especially in the winter time is when it'll be a big problem. So it's good to have a battery tender. So I'll turn it on, do the doors, turn it off, and then that's as long as the doors are all done within like half hour or 45 minutes, in most cases you'll be fine. <sighs> yeah, we'll come back to you. Um, oh yeah, actually yesterday, 2015. So if it's like brand new stuff, it's fine, but on, brand, on cars that are, I don't know, anywhere from like seven to 10 years old, that's usually where somebody hasn't replaced a battery. It might be getting lower. It's fine for daily use, but when you just leave it on without doing anything about it, then you might have an issue. The hybrid's definitely my go-to. I appreciate the info. How would I go about sharpening them? So I have a little overkill setup for that. There's, there's a couple popular ways. One of them is with a card sharpener. That's something you can throw in the toolbox and kind of carry around with you. I sometimes slip up on that thing. So it's literally like a plastic tool and you can run it across your squeegee blade and it, it'll shave just a little teeny tiny bit off. This is what um, I use more regularly though. I'm not gonna do it on this hybrid blade because this one is new, newer. Um, that one's kind of abused. That one's kind of abused. Oh, this one, this would probably be a good example right here. So let's put this in a vise. So I will squeak this down and just leave a tiny bit over the edge. Usually I have to do more than just a tiny bit, but you know, whatever the least amount that you can get by with. Tighten that down and then I'll take a blade. It would be smart to have more blade than this, but this should work. I'm gonna replace my blade afterwards. And then I'll just shave off the end. So you can do that with like a ruler or pretty much anything. So you cut off that much. You just need a nice straight edge. And then you take these little nubbins and you can just like, basically just like Try and shave those off. And then you got a squeegee blade. So eventually you work your way in to this bevel. But you get a nice sharp edge and it's, it's, it's made of all the good material, right? So the longer you can keep that going, the better. They're like $20 squeegee blades. They have two sides. So you can, you can keep them going for quite a while. Why do you never use the plotter? You don't watch enough, that's why. You just watch all the times I hand cut. <laughs> Dog shit advice, I like your username. <laughs> How bad does the temperature affect the process? I'm planning on tinting out of my home garage, so the tent, oh. Anything above freezing is fine. You don't have to worry about your room temperature. It's just when you're in like the 40s, you're not quite at freezing, 
but your hands are getting cold. So if anything, it'll affect you more than it's gonna affect anything with the work. You just can, you can tint above freezing. Um, in your home garage too, uh, I used to do that and go to a hardware store and buy a, a torpedo propane heater. They look like a little jet engine. They're pretty cool. I had an adjustable one. It was like a hundred ish dollars and they last a long time. Like they last a really long time. So go get a tank of propane, keep an extra one on hand, uh, just in case if you run out of propane. But what it'll do is it'll heat up your garage in probably about, like I'd have it crank. So my adjustable one would go from 30,000 BTU to 80,000. So I'd have it cranked up on 80 for probably about 15 minutes. And then it got toasty to the point where I had to take off my jacket. And then while you're moving around, you don't notice the temperature dropping quite as much. So you get a good hour in an uninsulated garage. Hour-ish, maybe like hour and a half before you feel like you have to turn it on again for like another 10 minutes. You can always turn it down on low, but I would often just turn it back off. So you can maintain a pretty good temperature in an uninsulated garage. I really liked it. But yeah, for an electric heater, they're not going to get hot enough, quick enough. Um, they're, it, the heat's going to dissipate too fast. So you really need it wired up for like 220. Even then, it's going to take too long unless you had it like maintained. And propane, yeah, it's, it's totally fine. I had some people that were concerned on like, oh, you're gassing your whole garage, you should have some ventilation and stuff. I mean, maybe, it never made me feel lightheaded or anything. So take that for what you will. I mean, I do have a crazy head set up, so I'm probably not all there, but hey, we can still get some cars done, so I'm fine. I like tinning from home, it was great. Especially when it, with nice weather outside. I left the garage door open in the beginning. It was, it was nice. I mean, it's crazy to make $1,000 from home and then literally like not go anywhere. And then like a lot of people paid in cash too. So I was like, oh, this is, this is fun. This is our whole rent today. It was great. I, the most upsetting thing, I was so mad when I had to move out of my home garage. The most upsetting thing was like, ugh, now I actually have to leave the house to go to a shop. And so it was a hard transition for me in the beginning because I'm not a timely person, but I, like, I wondered how I would be with my own shop. The, and what I noticed is, okay, I'm not reliable to come in when, when those okay. So I open up at 10, but if it's 10 o'clock and I don't have an appointment, I'm not gonna be here at 10. That's just not happening. But if I have an appointment, I have to then be here at like 9.30 because sometimes the appointments would get here at like 9.45 or 9.40. And so I hated being here when they were sitting outside. So my customers keep me on time. And then once I'm here, I'm good. It's just like getting me out of 
the house to go somewhere. It's, it's, ugh. But then once you're up and moving, then it's like, all right, let's go. Wait. But now it's especially hard because we actually like have to make videos. And so I looked at, like there's a lot of lost time. So if I have an appointment now with Jack here, I will come in at like little after 10 typically um, because otherwise we don't get a video done. And then if I don't get a video done, then I'm sad. So now I have to come in with no appointments, but it wasn't like that in the beginning. I tuned out of the home garage, March through August. And then I had to leave because I got a notice from the city. It was either like an annoying neighbor or somebody on stream. I don't know. And it's not like the city's gonna tell me. <laughs> They're just gonna say stop. And then I called and I talked to them and I thought I was okay. And then still got another notice. Aw, if you don't get a video done, we're sad too. Yeah, so this last week especially has been really disappointing because I'm like, I, I always get caught in between making videos and actually doing work because you can't really do both. So like, yeah, I have cars here to tint, but that means that I have like three to four hours to tint them. So sometimes we can do a TikTok video if we have a good idea coming into it and a plan for it. But most of the time I have to do my videos on my own cars just so I have the extra time. And then especially if I wanna just rip off a piece of film I don't want to use a, a customer's vehicle as that demonstration. Hi. They're here to fulfill your orders. Luke might mess up your orders though. I don't know. He tries. And then he walks away. What's the plastic stuff? She's late. <laughs> she gets to come in whenever she wants to. As long as the orders get done, I don't care. <laughs> oh my God, I keep thinking this car is off. This is the quietest roll down window I think I've ever had. No. See, he likes the Christmas tree. You could throw stuff in the trash can. Well, I guess if it's not your toys. <laughs> Luke, Matt is your father. Yeah, that's going to be a long-running joke. <laughs> okay, the plastic, stay tuned because we're switching that out soon. Right now we're using Carpet Shield, but don't use it because it's too expensive. It went from like $30 a roll to $50 a roll. So it's basically just like throwing window tent rolls away. <laughs> it was always supposed to be a temporary solution. quite curved. I have no idea. Is it just like a rubber seal around the border? Because that just sounds like a pain. 
you you're going to want to leave a gap on it. Have you seen the door covers from Soak Shield? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the I have the set from uh, Doors Protector. The problem with the Soak Shield ones is that they're toweled. So they're, they're going to soak in water, so they're going to be good for literally the front doors, and then you can't use them for the rest of the day until they dry out. The Doors Protector set is the best reusable set that I've seen. I should be using it right now. But it's I, they're just there's always something else to do. So when something has like more pieces and a learning curve and I just have to like keep track of stuff, then all of a sudden I don't. So I'll come around to it. Just give me a little bit. Today would have been a good day. But then I had this one checked in and I had to figure out if they actually wanted 5% or 15. Uh, rubber seals, yeah, yeah, yeah. So rubber, so that's like a classic car. Not fun. Anything with rubber seals, like the outside. Uh, so here's the thing, if you cut it exact on the outside, it's gonna be too large on the inside because the surface area is smaller on the inside around that curve. So you can't tuck it into the rubber seal. So your only option is to leave a gap. Mind the gap. And the best fix I've seen is literally leaving like a wider border. Go get some like black pinstriping and just overlap that around the outside. It's not gonna be the most, like, yeah, it would be nice if there was some other way to do it. It's just that the other way to do it would be removing the window entirely, tinting beyond the gasket. So if you can't, if that's just not feasible, then I would leave a gap and then pinstripe it on the outside. I feel like I'm using three ounces. This is still two ounces. So it's probably not gonna be a permanent solution. Like, so that was a trick that um, I learned from, from Rick. He does all the tint keg stuff, Sun Distributing. He's been tinting for like 30 years. He's done a classic, a bunch of, like a ton of classic cars. He grew up in that area. And that was the best thing that he said he's come up with. It's just like, you can fight with the edges. There's always dirt. People aren't removing those windows for you. So you don't want to risk damaging the glass in any way. You're trying to keep things, you know, they're only paying so much to get the work done. So it's just, there's not really a realistic solution that you can do unless you just kind of like get close and then seam the edges. I quit the dealership like you told me to. Did I tell you that? And my life has been so much better. I forget exactly what the situation was, but dude, that is so cool to hear. What happened? There, if I remember right, like, and this is the case for a lot of dealerships, they'll pay somebody like a really cheap wage because the dealership just sees like, cheap hourly work. They don't really realize that tint is like a skilled trade. So they'll pay you like, I don't know. What were they paying you? I'm gonna wait for some answers, but probably 18. <laughs> Ah, oh, there it is, yep. 16 an hour flat rate. 
Dude, I Jack gets like seventeen dollars an hour just to fill orders. <laughs> Like, how the fuck are you going to pay a window tinner? Fucking $16 an hour. If you manage to tint one set of doors a day, you are making more money than working all day at the dealership for $16 an hour. Yeah, I actually left yesterday. I drove an hour there, an hour back. 18-hour flag rate, four hours, four hours per full, one and a half, two fronts. Okay. I actually left yesterday, drive an hour there and an hour back for 18 hour flag rate, four hours per full, uh, one hour for two fronts. Oh, well, I see. Four hours for a full and then one hour for two fronts. So it's like $18 an hour. So you get $18 for turning two front doors. Get this two fronts and a strip, 1,000. I chuckled and left. Yep. We got two hours for a full. Damn. Yeah, that's, so you make 16 times two, so that's $32. Yes, simple math, I can do that one. $32 an hour for a full car. Or you get $32 for the full car. <laughs> the thing is like, so even if you do one car at a hundred dollars you're making more money than you were making there and like the thing is you know how to tent so this is what they don't understand they're going to constantly be going through the exact same cycle until they find people that literally cannot leave and then they can teach them how to tent it's it's a skilled trade that the money is in the trade and it's very easy to go, I don't know, even charge like 80 bucks for a set of doors. I start at 120 for a set of doors here. All while the dealership sells the tint job for $1,500. That to me is like crazy. I, I hate that. Why would you like... If you're making good money, then that needs to pass on to the people that do the trade. Like there needs to be like a mutual beneficial thing there. It gets so one-sided and then they're, like, cause look at, look at it the other way. They're charging $1,500. If they charged, if they paid the installer, like this would be an insane wage. If they paid the installer, like $500 a car, they'd still make $1,000, and then they would have a line of window tinners out the door trying to work for them. And their quality would be high, everything would be good. But they don't. And so then they're gonna hire people that suck at tinning, their customers are gonna be unhappy, and they're gonna have to constantly get more people. But that's what they do in their other department, so why not in the window tinting department? It's so dumb. I work for a used dealer and make 35%, but I do all the work. I try and stay around for 35 an hour. See, 35% is still like pretty good. I was anywhere from like 30 to 50% when I was tinting for other people. 15 or 50% was like, really high as far as a commission goes. If you're doing that at a shop, the shop is not making money. <laughs> the installer is making all the money. They basically have a 50% partner <laughs> with no investment. It's pretty crazy. Oh, am I going to use the plotter? Yeah, let me hand cut this back window and then I'll, I'll plot the quarter windows. Do you miss working at the glass shop? No, not at all. Not even a little bit. Oh, I fell. Sorry. 
No, I definitely don't miss it. Like, yeah, it's fun to like pop in and talk to those guys. But I've got a fun thing going here. I so and there's a lot of days too that like you just get unnecessary curveballs and those were the most upsetting I think. Let me just put this here for now. So they called me and every once in a while they're like, hey, we have a couple of warranty issues. Um, could you make it out and fix them? Um, so if that was like an old customer that I, either I did or they, the last time was they had an installer. Um, and so they just had some angry people that needed to get some work fixed. And they're like, it's just a handful of things. It's mostly just front doors. Is there any way you could set aside a, a day? We'll pay you obviously to do it. Just please come in and fix this trashy work. And I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll come on in. And it was just like a miserable day. <laughs> so I don't, I don't regret it at all. Most of the appointments actually bailed on the day that I schedule. And then the one that I had to fix was like this old ass truck. And then it, he brought in his own film. It was like one of the weirdest situations. It's like, are you kidding me? They're like, I'm sorry. We told him it wouldn't turn out good. And then it didn't turn out good. And now we have to fix it. And it's like, no, you actually don't have to fix it. You told him it wouldn't turn out good. It didn't turn out good. And now you feel bad. You shouldn't have taken the job in the first place. They know that. But then here we are. How beneficial is a plotter? Does it make perfect cuts every time so you don't have... No, that's what everybody wants. Plotters don't make perfect cuts every time. It all depends on your software. Some cars are really good, some cars aren't. You have to use the plotter a lot to kind of get an idea of what cars it's good with and what, you know, every software is gonna be a little different. They're very good production tools. So if I had 10 cars to do in a day, yes, I would be using a plotter and it's just a volume thing. Most people don't care about the very little stuff. So like, if your edge isn't perfectly flush, like most people aren't gonna notice that unless you point it out. So every once in a while, you'll just, you have patterns that are off and you'll hand cut them. It's just a numbers game. Okay, 15, oh, and then I'm gonna do that. That doesn't, this doesn't make any sense. I'm gonna have all this film left over because I gotta. This is why you don't get only. See, I hardly ever do 15, so I only have it in a 40 inch roll. This is why you don't only have it in a 40 inch roll because then you throw it on the back window <laughs> and you get all this extra. But it's fine. I'll plot the quarters because why not? How much do you need to invest in a tent? Invest uh, for a home garage. Clean up your garage. That's sweeping the floors, tidying it up. Paint the walls just so they look clean. That's gonna be the biggest thing, is making a good impression that you actually care from home. Um, other than that, most of your money is just gonna be inventory and some tools. So you'll probably have about 300 bucks in buying every window tint tool that you could possibly need. And then other than that, it's just like fancy stuff to dress up your, uh, your home garage. So like I did this flooring in my home garage, but I didn't do it till I was in there for at least like three months. And even then it felt like it was like, oh, spending like $2,000 on my flooring. That's excessive. But I was so happy once I did. 
people always thought they were coming to a shop and they'd be like, uh, is that a house? I'm like, yeah, but it's really cool. <laughs> Not everybody wants to go to a house. What do you think about dry shrink prep compared to normal dryer sheets? Dry shrink prep is great. I go back and forth between dryer sheets and dry shrink prep because dry shrink prep is always a little more difficult to explain, especially when you're making short tiktok -y videos, and I've been using it for a long time. Um, it's also a little bit more foolproof in how much you need to apply. So if you get like snuggles dryer sheets, you can just put a real thick layer on the glass. With dry shrink prep, you want to put a very thin layer on it. So when you're more of an experienced installer, like you can still use it in the beginning. Um, it's just you don't always know what you're looking for. So that's why like I still train people with snuggles just to try and keep things as simple as I possibly can. Um, but if I am setting up the window, dry shrink prep sets up faster. So then we'll just, I'll, I'll apply it on the window. I'll show them what to do. I just want to make sure they'll do it right because I'll show them how to do it and then they'll pick it up. They'll douse everything and they'll put a huge thick layer on it and then wonder like, hey, was this too much? Where the dryer sheet is just like, oh yeah, yeah, you can't, you can't put enough dryer sheet on it. Or you can't put too much. So there's, there's definitely a little more tack with, uh, with dry shrink prep too. It's not gonna make anything easier. It's, it's just gonna be a different, healthier way. You don't put dryer sheets all over your hands. I ordered my tools and a 36 inch roll and was like $400 altogether. Yeah, that's not bad. Like the thing is, if you're gonna be an auto mechanic, you're gonna have like three, $400 in an impact gun. So with window tinning, you can have like 300, three or $400 and, be like, and have like every window tinning tool that you could ever want. There's just not a lot of expense. And that's like you have extra different types of squeegees. Everything that you see me use in this video, minus like the bulldozer, the side swipe, um, is what I use on basically every friggin' car. You don't need a lot to tin a car, and the more specialty tools are just to help with situations. You don't even have to tape side seals. It's just like something new that we've been doing for a while now. Especially on something like this. This is a new car, it's got rubber seals. Do I need to tape them? No. But then I show people on something like this and then next thing I know they are doing, oh this is on six. No wonder it's going slower. I forgot about that. I think I'm gonna send this heat gun back. I want I really want to see where this one stacked up. This is the 1920. It's like $160. I'm going for the 2320. Planning on dropping down to only two offerings at my shop, Pro Nano or C2. Wait, why? Hey bud, nice hair. Why would you do that? You should keep three. Why two? See, I have all three of those options and I'm more than happy. Like this right now, um, it's for somebody that's brought me quite a few cars, so I'm doing them a solid. He doesn't know how much of a solid he's getting. C2 
See, with dryer sheets, I'd be able to just move this a little bit more. It's just the way that I'm doing this back window. Come on, come on. I just need to sneak it up a little bit more. They really don't give you very much on this. I'd be better off hand cutting, or platter cutting this one than fussing about with this. But it should be fine, let's check it. Dryer sheet or baby powder, dryer sheet all day. Oh yeah, they give you space up there, that's fine. They just put the spoiler in the way, stupid. I never understood baby powder. I've seen people used it. I've never really used it very much at all. I just didn't like it. So what a dryer sheet does, or dry shrink prep, is it lays down a waxy surface on the window. So you want something for the film to stick to. You need something for the film to stick to when you're carting it down. All it is is to help with organization. I prefer baby powder. Well, you're weird. <laughs> Your son is walking. Oh, he jumps now. He is like two and a half now. Yeah, they do grow up fast, it's crazy. Yikes. Wiper, why are you dumb? Why are you so dumb? This is like a really weird one too. Usually they give you a little more border. This one does not give you any border on the outside. It's all on the inside. off and I'm gonna shrink it. I'm just gonna move it out of the way when I shrink it. Just kind of cutting it to size right now. All right, there we go. Now I can shift the whole thing up. <laughs> See, that's where, that's, that's exactly how I feel about baby powder. I was taught with a dryer sheet, and so it seems like whatever you're using early on is really what you kind of gravitate towards. So I've tried baby powder, I just don't get it. But really, you can see how this is sticking right here? So it floats. And what I mean by that, like, you see how you can wiggle it? And it's not, like, it's pulling back up. As soon as I card it, look, it's, like, frozen. So then you have this loose material here. And so when you shrink it, you, you, it just it has space to move and, like, contract together. So then you hit it with a heat gun. It contracts together. And then your card is an organization tool. So unless you kind of like push it and smooth it, like you're, you're effectively like stretching it. What you watching there? That looks fun. So watch, see, you got this big finger loose area here. You hit it with some heat and it pulls together and now it's sitting towards the glass. And all you're doing is you're pushing those air bubbles forward and you're just kind of like shifting that film forward until it forms like another bulked up area and then you're shrinking that together and so that all that dryer sheet or dry shrink prep or what you have underneath acts like a little glue attack surface so when you put it down it doesn't just shoot right back up So 
So baby powder doesn't really act as much like a tacking surface. So that's what really always would throw me off. But this to me is very straightforward. I heat the film, I see it do the line, I press it or I push it forward until it bulks up again and then that's the next spot that I, I should shrink in. And then so doing this is just doing all those steps without stopping. You just, you're heating it up, you're watching for it to lay smooth, and then you're pressing it forward. You're, you're almost guesstimating where it's gonna be when you put that heat. How good is Geo for somebody trying to start a mobile service? You can, like, Geo, you can run any service off of it. I don't suggest learning with, like, Pro Classic, because that can get expensive. Because a lot of times you're just throwing film out, but yeah, Geo's great. I was doing Geo Mobile, using Avery Dennison Mobile, I was using ASWF Mobile, I was using a lot of different films mobile. But if what you're doing, like, works for you, then you don't have to, like, switch over into, like, another method unless you see some sort of, like, speed advantage. That's what I look out for. I love the Facebook group. Every once in a while, somebody comes out with a little idea that I never thought of before, and it's like, oh, that's cool. And then I adapt that into what I do. I, I, like, Facebook group is all about just finding a better process and people sh sharing what they do. And helping out with people trying to figure out where they are messing up and how to fix it. Just trying to start my own business. Yeah, they're, they're okay, so they're definitely a good option. I have less options for like saving money on good film now, just because inflation is definitely a thing. So like even the budget options aren't as budget as what they used to be. If you want just to practice film, TView off of Amazon actually is a good practice film, and then go out right up into um, a better film. It's really not expensive. Because like, Pro Class, I'll use, I'll use Pro Classic as a good example. Most color stable dyed films for a 36, actually let's just say color stable. Most color stable dyed film rolls, so ones that are guaranteed to last, and if they fail, they have a good warranty behind it, are going to be in the neighborhood of 180, 185 for like a 36-inch roll to like maybe 250 for a 36-inch roll. Just depends on who you're buying it from. A real cheap roll of pra a practice film is going to be... A hundred bucks? So when you split that over eight cars, you don't have a lot of expense in tinting a car. It comes down to just doing it. So like that's what always drives me a little nutty when I see like I don't know, people nickel and diming film costs. It's like, when you break it down, yeah, like if you're just buying film, yes, you see the final price and oh, big expense. But then you break it down to what you're actually gonna spend per car. It's not bad. Can I make this higher or is this like hit me in the head? So, out of a 40 inch by 100, all the sides and the rears, you can get about eight cars. So then literally take that $200 price tag, 250, 350, divide it by eight, and then you'll have your film cost per car without mistakes.
So on a real economy film that a lot of people would talk about, <laughs> your film cost is like $15 <laughs> a car. <laughs> With a better film, your film cost might be like 25 to $30 per car. Is it enough to care about? No. No, it's not. Where it really hurts, though, is when you're only charging $100 to $150 a car, and you do infrequent jobs. And then you have, like, shop rent and other stuff. That's when you need to up your prices or up your volume, one or the other. Something's got to give. Because if you're only doing, like, two cars at... 150 a car and trying to sustain a shop like you're just not gonna be able to do it. There's not enough money there You need like more than enough money to pay for your home expenses and grow your business And you really only do that when you feel like you're making way more money Like you get to you have to get to a more comfortable amount of money to make those kinds of decisions where it's like, I'm gonna throw $3,000 at my floor just to make it look better. It's like, you really only do that when you feel like you have a good cushion and your business is going well. That only happens when you charge higher prices, but then with that, you can then hire people and grow your business and actually give customers better customer service. Oh, <laughs> no, 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 no. I need you to not play with the mouse. You will end the stream. <laughs> or you will change scenes. Oh, and for the keyboard, too, probably. <laughs> probably got to hope. If he'll push any button, it'll be the one to end the stream. how the expression it takes money to make money applies to something yeah because then you start doing stuff for your business that is more fun and stands out and then you get more business from it like what what kind of like for for a lot of people it's like you you might see the floor and go, what kind of actual realistic return on investment are you gonna get from putting like three, five, ten thousand dollars into your floor? It's like, you, there's no realistic immediate return that you're gonna get, but you're gonna feel way better about your floor. The pictures that you take of the cars are gonna look like, it's just you're going to look way more professional. And those are, like, less tangible things that add up when all of a sudden you start then being more confident about your business and your prices and you start charging more and then realize not everybody is going to complain when you're like, hey, it's going to cost $700 to tint this car. And they go, oh, okay, when can I schedule? And then you're like, wait, what? So, playing around with those prices, figuring out what's a happy medium for you, where you have lots of people coming in, less problems, you're making decent money doing it. But what's cool too is like, even just getting off the ground, when you're, when you're like, this is why I really feel bad for anybody that was making like less than $20 an hour tending at a dealership. It's like, it's very easy to go from zero to making good money when you know how to tint. 
because if you're tanning uh, one car in a day for 150 bucks, you're in a better situation. And you just learn the, the more you get into it, there's other reasons to be above $150. But at least getting out of a dealership into like a better situation, oh, it's so nice. <laughs> yeah, I believe me, I've been there too. I'm like, look, I only have this section of the floor done. The rest of it came epoxied, and I'm not doing the rest of the floor. I've done my unit. Uh, lovely. Floor ran out of money. I got quotes for 9,000 pounds. So, yeah, yeah, I would hold off too. I didn't do my showroom for over a year. It looked like garbage. Like, I, I, was, I felt bad for people when they walked in the door. Because you drive around the back of the shop... There's a small sign on the door. You walk in, and it looked like, wait, am I at the right place? Where now when you walk in, it's like, oh, shoot, what is this cool, like, around the back spot? But I was dealing with that for a whole nother year until I was starting to charge more. I was making more money. And then saved up a little more money to do that, and then the right time came along, and then we redid the showroom. Oh, yeah, I got to use that roll. I'm going to have a sip of coffee, and then I'll do the rest. Oh, where's Jack? Jack's on vacation. He's in Florida. It's kind of not fair, because he's taking, like, a two-and-a-half-week Florida vacation, and then he's, he's going be he's going to be going down there for college anyway. So do you want to do the quarter windows? Well, I didn't understand that one. I can't pick you up right now, though. What? Where are we going? <laughs> All right, let's do these quarter windows. How many more cars? Uh, I don't have anything else scheduled after this, um, but I am going to try and do a video today, so. Hey, 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 Nope, nope. <laughs> Don't play with the keyboard, please. Why do people think 15 is the same as 5? I always tell people it's the same as 20 because people get numbers in their heads and they try and look up pictures online and there really is no... There really is no real way of understanding what your car is going to look like before it's tinted without actually having it tinted or seeing like a demo car there. He is trying to sabotage me. Okay, what do I, do I do? Yeah, we'll be fine, that's fine. That was a, that's a good question. How did, how did you start getting your first few customers? Um, start listing yourself in places where you can be found. So the biggest things for me was we started running some Facebook ads. We had a Facebook business profile. I had a home website. My wife actually, like, she was the biggest push to getting started because I did so much, like, over planning. And then she said, when are you actually going to get started? <laughs> and then I actually got started. It's way easy to overthink everything and then realize, like, oh, there's, like, other things that I need to do. Um, but I've been focusing on the wrong things. Like, it's nice to put together, like, a, a nice website so you have some information so you look more legitimate. Do a Google Maps listing. Do an a Apple Maps listing. Um, and then just get started. Because what you'll find out is you can work on all these things while you're available. 
um, to start tinting. And then you'll have all these things in place, and then you won't have any business. So it's like you can work on all those things while you're, uh, while you're going. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> He's <laughs> really not happy. Good job, Plotter. You did great. All right. So 66 grams is way too much. We're going to bump that down to like 50... All right, let's try it again. Yeah, it was just up too high. See, plotter's not where it's at. Oh, shit, still? Oh, my God. Stop it. $15 gone. Now 30. Uh, hang on. I still feel like that was enough. It probably pushed it up in a weird spot, though. All right. This will be way too little. I think it was just bunched up. I still think 50 is going to be light, but whatever, we'll run it. <sighs> mm, that's still a little heavy, huh? That's weird. No, all right. Okay. And cut gang. Yeah, no kidding. No, last thing I cut was like I've just been doing a bunch of pro nano. I had recently swapped out the blade, and then that leaves me at square one with everything. So usually I can guesstimate where I need to be for carbon. Um, but today we did not. So that was fun. So that's what happens when your pressure is too high. It, what it does is it cuts through the film and it cuts through the liner and then you don't have any structure left in the film and so it all just bunches. Oh, no, that's all good though. So then that's like the worst thing that can happen because then you start digging the blade into the cut strip. But we're using Gorilla Tape, so it might hold up better. If you use a plotter, you're not a tinter. Man, how that whole thing has completely flip-flopped. Dude, that used to be the, the attitude in like, the old forum groups and stuff. You couldn't even talk about them. Now, if you hand cut a lot of stuff, you get so many more people that are now like, why aren't you using the plotter? Plotter's faster, plotter's better. It's like, man, I do both. Plotters are best for places that are just tedious to hand cut. I mean, they just, they're better at it. They're better than you. They're faster than you. You can plotter cut the back window on a truck far before somebody can hand cut it. 
you just can. Wrangler back window, yeah, Potter's gonna outpace you. It just will. What's your settings for Pro Classic? Look at these dinky little things. Uh, the Pro Classic settings are gonna be the same as the C2. But yeah, yeah, plotters can also rip through your film. So, you can, you can have, you can screw it up both ways. Hand cutting, you can screw it up. Plotters, you can still screw it up. If you're going to use the plotter, I suggest using it regularly. Because then you, you, you learn the quirks of it. I've hand cut for the last, like, that's why I didn't remember what the settings were for it. I haven't hand cut hardly, or I haven't plotter cut hardly anything in, like, the past couple weeks here. It's just been hand cutting everything. So then it, we did it on stream for Pro Nano. So it was set up for that, but I hadn't played around with C2. So I dialed it back to what I usually do, and it's like, oh, no. <laughs> Bye-bye. And then I dialed it back even more, and it still was not happy. But had I cut this film out on a plotter yesterday for C2, we wouldn't have had that issue. So I just don't use it very often especially when I'm bouncing back and forth between options. All right, let's put this back down. What's the most daft name for a tint tool? The Stroke Doctor was pretty funny. There's like the Little Chiseler, the Stroke Doctor, the Shank, like those are some of the silly ones. Oh yeah, the conquistador. Yep. Yep, conquistador is pretty good. I don't hardly ever use that. It's been like completely outdated by the triage stuff. I still have them. I still like them, but I hardly ever touch them. Dude, I love this little thing. You just get a perfect squeegee, and it reaches in small spaces. <laughs> Ooh. We almost lost the whole coffee. That would have been really bad. We only lost some of the coffee. Can you make it as a self-taught tinter from watching videos? Yep. Yep, there's actually people that do it and tell me that they've started their own tint businesses from watching my channel. Get some film, get some tools, practice a lot, and then go back and rewatch and try and figure out where your mistakes are. That's like the biggest thing. There's people that, there's some people that just don't see what their mistakes are unless somebody points it out to them. They're like, oh, I'm putting it on the glass. Oh, I'm shrinking it. Oh, I'm doing this. And it's like, no, 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 no. It doesn't look flat. You're not following, it's like you're doing things that are tinter-like, but you're not really paying attention. As long as you can really pay attention, yeah, for sure. All the things are there. Nothing's taken out. What's a conquistador? Oh my god. I will show you. I was, gonna, I was just gonna say a little bit before that question, there's a lot of people that don't know what those tools even are. So it's like, I don't know, people come up with funny tint names and stuff, but what I've noticed more recently about window tint websites is they actually, like, they don't explain what any of the tools are. 
So there's like so many squeegees to pick from, but like what the fuck do I actually need? I thought I was like in the opposite direction with my website. But I, I come to find out it's actually really helpful. We started making TikTok videos on my site to at least help show you what you need those tools for. No, 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 called tint slip because most people ask, what slip solution do I need? So that's why we put slip in the name. It's literally as self-explanatory as it can be. It's tint slip. Um, which cars should you avoid accepting to do as a beginner? Um, I would avoid anything pre-2000s for the most part. There's definitely easy cars that are pre-2000s, but at this point, you are 23 years out of the 2000s. That's insane. One, I don't feel old, but holy shit, that's a long time ago. But you get a lot of weird stuff, and those cars are, have, in most cases, were not cool cars back then. Like, yeah, there are cool cars, but, like, a lot of them are not taken care of. And you're just getting into weird shit that you don't see anymore. So don't, like, scare yourself out of a challenge or anything. But if you want to make life easier on yourself, just avoid old cars like that. So if somebody calls with, like, a 90s F-150, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> probably has vent windows, probably has dumb seals, and you're probably going to go, well, what the hell is this? Okay. So I like, un it's not that this is too wide. It's that it's too wide for this one. Not quite. It's actually really good at that little bit. The squeegee is amazing. This is like, my new favorite thing ever. It's just so helpful. <laughs> it's such a silly way. It's like, why do you need that dumb little squeegee? I'm thinking about changing my cars from 120 for cars and 175 for trucks. Dude, I don't touch anything full for like less than 290, so. I think you're starting to catch up. But like that's here. Don't just don't take that too much out of context. That's easy to say. Um, but it sounds like you're just and uh, you just yeah. I don't, I don't know the area you're in. I don't know who you're talking to, but you're gonna have a hard time at even those prices as far as like wherever you're at. I mean hard time as in like the people that you probably deal with are not fun. I don't think area matters as much as some people might think. Um, but there's definitely different challenges in different areas, for sure. So, good example was we used to tent in, or I used to tent in Clinton, Clinton Township or East Point. Those are not like the fanciest of areas. They have like very Detroit style buildings if you go down the wrong side street, like burnt down houses, broken windows, and shit. We would still get over 250 a car there. It depends on who's selling. When you have somebody that is just like excited to be there and is actually good at talking to people and puts time and care into it all, dude, you don't have to charge 150 bucks. 
The only areas I couldn't tell you as much about is like you are in a much more rural area where it's like slow and there just aren't a lot of people and everybody kind of knows everybody. I've never tinted out in those areas, but I can tell you when there's more people, yeah, you can find the right clients in a lot of places. Mm. Do you have a film cut code to try out? Yeah, plotter software. Uh, Tint Studio, and it'll give you free 30 days so you can play around with it. So that's what we just used to cut out these quarter windows, which are looking great. So that's cool. That makes my life easy. So yeah, the most pain in the ass part about this window would be trying to cut this thing out with the mirror and stuff in the way. It's just very tedious, so that's why I like plotter cutting them. And when they line up right, it's just, my whole life is easier. It's beautiful, I love it. I should throw those out, I'm never gonna use them. What about the plotter software Sun Distributing is selling? Yeah, oh, it's great, film, uh, 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 what, uh, computer cut. Computer cut, they're selling for 200 bucks a month. I would highly suggest that if you have a little bit more money to spend on plotter software, get that over film cut, probably. I'm guessing. I've used it like a while ago. It's been around for the longest. It's by SolarGuard. They invented plotter software. It's, it's legitimately good stuff. I want to get a code to it so I can play around with it, just so I can have a refresher. I don't remember it being like the perfect, perfect software, but I remember it being really damn good. There is, I don't think there is a perfect software. I should probably swap this blade out with this, with the, see they have a non-cropped one. Oh, and that's much, okay, I'll just do it. Maybe we'll do blue. Blue's a little stiffer, orange is a, ooh, I like the flex on the orange. Let me do the orange still. Orange is noticeably flexier. That's cool. Uh, yeah, film cut, that's what I'm using right now. Plotterdepot.com has it. Mike with the five. Trying to get my website up and going, any tips? Yes, a lot of tips. Um, a lot of platforms have templates. Use a template or go to Fiverr. I don't know, like, I don't know the other sites that are like Fiverr, but Fiverr has a lot of like uh, artsy and, you know, like programmers, web designers, and stuff um, that basically have that business down to a science and can whip you together a business site very quickly um, and they know what they're doing. If you want to save some money, um, then definitely use like a, the, the, also they'll probably use a template, which is fantastic. So mine is on Wix.com right now. And it could look better. It doesn't look as good as my Shopify store does. So it, like, it just depends on the template. So what I mean by template is like, essentially it's like when you go buy like a thank you card right? It looks pretty, it's well done up, and then you add some text. That's essentially what a lot of these website builders are now. They give you designs, they give you functions, and then you basically add pictures and text, and then you start customizing it a little bit, but you don't have to do very much. So Squarespace, um, Wix, those are some template builder sites that'll do that, and that's pretty friggin' cool. So, look in that direction. Um, there's also 10 million YouTube videos on all this stuff, too, so binge watch a lot of them. Uh, coupon usage has been reached. Really? Okay. Well, I'm gonna yell at them then. Uh, 
Um, also, their chat. Here, if you want to speed things up a little bit, they have a really good chat support. So if you shoot them a message and just say, hey, Matt's on stream right now and said I, there's a coupon code, tell them he's very angry that it's not working, and then they'll make it work. <laughs> I'm sure they'll get it done real fast. No, they're nice people. They probably just don't know. Or they were forced to cancel it and then they didn't tell me <laughs> which would be like super weird so I don't know do you remove door panels sometimes yeah if they're really really difficult so I actually have an Lexus uh, I think like an ES 250 or something like that coming in not today but I will remove the um, I don't have to remove the panel but I pull back the panel pop out the seals, because otherwise it's an utter pain to do. Okay, I'll ask good. <laughs> They're good people over there. It's just one of those, like, ah, there should be a coupon code, and for whatever reason, that it's not working, so. Matt's on a stream. He said there's a coupon code, and it didn't work. And now he's pissed. Yeah, it is very rare to see me pull seals because I'm kind of in this in-between of I learned how to tint, and the idea of removing panels was not even, like, an option. So I learned to tint this way. So like, if it's easy to remove the seals on this, this is a really easy one to tint without, without removing two. So it's like, a lot of the cars where they're very simple to remove, they're also very simple to tint for me. So I don't have a reason to remove them. Also, Bottom loading so straightforward to explain anyways. You just pull out the seal and you just drop it in the window. Like there's not much to learn as far as the install process. It's about learning how to remove that door panel on that car. I'm gonna try the blue one and we'll see how we like the blue one. There is a noticeable flex difference between these. The orange ones are much softer, but I like that because you get a really good bend. So we'll see about the blues. The blues are still like plenty Flexible. Ooh, I like that one too. Damn. Ooh, actually, we might go blue. Look how clean. There's not a friggin' line of water anywhere on there. It's just to get up towards the top, perfectly friggin' clean. Ugh, I can't do that very well with a turbo. It always leaves a little water behind. That's awesome. I love these little things. They're so handy. Your wife is doing awesome with shipping and store items. Bebo, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Damn it. She, <laughs> she needs a raise now. That's what she said. Dang, dude, what are you, what are you trying to do? seen you tin a sunroof? Yeah, I hardly ever do sunroofs. I've I've done some uh, sunroofs, but it's just kind of rare. They're pretty straightforward. They're just more obnoxious to cut out than anything. <laughs> oh shoot, my bad. <laughs> Enrique says he will be ordering some more stuff shortly. 
See, she's just playing a game right now. <laughs> what are you, are you playing Mobile Legends? Yeah. yeah see, it's like the, it's such a huge, such a nice job. When orders come in, orders get filled. Other than that, I don't know. When I film a video, I need you to hold a camera. That's about it. When's your next live? I'm not sure. Is that a no-no when you see tinters doing cuts on top of car windshields? Uh, for me, it is. There's smarter ways of doing it now, um, but it's a very old school thing. So it's just glass is different than it used to be. Seriously, if you go back to like 90s glass, shit was harder. And on some cars, it's perfectly fine. But then you're cutting on a piece of glass. And then you get that little hairline scratch through the whole thing. And I don't care how safe that you can pretend to be. You're just going to have that scratch through it. And then if you pretend that it's not there, most of the time it's not a problem. So it happens. People screw up glass and then they just don't say anything about it. And you better believe when I was at the glass shop, that's what really like pushed me over the edge to do something about it. Is doing like a BMW 3 Series. It wasn't an M Series, it was just 3 Series. Still would cost more than it. I made tinting the car to do it. And then I, I would get lazy about washing towels. I'd probably have about five to 10 microfiber towels to get me through a day. And I would wash them like maybe once every other week. So when I went to clean stuff off, everything was kind of like smeary anyways. So I'm not gonna wash your car when I was at one of those places. So you tint it, you wipe it down, there's smears on it, then you just deliver it. And then as long as it looks pretty good when you deliver it, then you're not gonna have a problem. But here I wipe off everything, so I don't tint at those places anymore. <laughs> it's just past window tinner. It's like there, there wasn't time to care. Now I, ha now I literally made the time to care. And I have this crazy setup and everything, and I take my sweet ass time with all these cars. And I just try and do as good as I can. Uh, but there was a time in between there um, where after I scratched that BMW back window, um, that's when I came up with the glass aid. It wasn't overnight, but I was trying to find something that I could take anywhere and it didn't rely on glass boards and it didn't take a bunch of extra time. I could throw it in my toolbox. And then, especially with the price of windshields, like if you scratch this windshield, this is gonna need a recal. Um, the whole thing's gonna have to get swapped out. Just the windshield is probably gonna be 650 and then you're gonna be another 350 for a recalibration on it. You're gonna be about anywhere from 800 to thousand dollars in that for an OEM windshield. That's ridiculous. That's more than I'll make on my most expensive carbon or ceramic job on this. It's crazy. How do you keep all the dust out? Um, there's very little time. Um, so you don't have to have like HEPA filters. You don't have to have a pretty garage or anything. What it really is about is keeping airflow mostly down. So like, you just don't want to feel a breeze coming at your car. That's like step one. And then I peel the film. So I clean the inside of the glass. Every time I go to tint it, squeegee it off, spray it, immediately come around, peel the tint, pick it up and put it here. As soon as it gets on the glass, Nothing else is falling into it. 
So it's maybe got 15, 20 seconds worth of exposure time. There's not a lot of chance for dust to really settle in on it. So you might get that occasional thing. Look around, if you see tons of floaties, yeah, that's gonna get into your tent. But if there's just only a little bit, yeah, you're not gonna have a problem. It just comes down to being efficient. Yeah, so dust and dirt in most cases, like your environment really isn't that big of a problem. So I used to tent in the bay where they would cut out speaker boxes when more people got those custom sound systems and stuff. They would build them from scratch. I tinted in the bay where they put those and built them, but they were not cutting and building speaker boxes while I was tinting. So they would do whatever they wanted to do. Then they would politely sweep out some of the bay, but there was still like sawdust everywhere. And so we would get there, we'd pull in the car, we would close the door, and then, you know, you're cutting things out. Things are still settling a little bit. But by the time you're ready to install, especially, it's fine. I wish I had pictures of some of those bays. <laughs> because, like, to me, it was just normal day-to-day -day stuff. But to some of you guys, you're probably like, oh, my God. Like, you would have full-size truck, open the door up to this much, and you would have a metal cage right here, or you would have a wood bench here. You couldn't open the door all the way without hitting the metal cage. So it was literally like, doors were like this. I would cut them out. I would open them up to here. I would scooch by. I'd open them up just a little bit more, clean the inside, do this, pull it off, squeak in here. And I did that all day, every day for a long time. Did you get Enrique's order? Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> she said she'll get to it next week. It got lost under the table now. Yeah, anytime you guys place an order, it immediately comes out of the printer. But she's in the middle of like a Mobile Legends game, so like. <laughs> it's not getting packed until so she's done with that. <laughs> it's okay, they don't take very long either. <laughs> But yeah, maybe next week it'll get sent out. <laughs> no, it'll get packed soon. No, she, she gets like upset at me uh, if there's not enough orders because she gets everything done so friggin' quick. And then it's like, what do I do now? And I'm like, uh, stop being so fast at orders. <laughs> Yeah, employee-boss relations. <laughs> What's Luke doing? <laughs> Do you like all those little... Okay, oh yeah, the Christmas tree. I'll show you guys the Christmas tree quick. He's currently playing with all the little things. The Christmas tree was here, and I had to move it. So... We have a horse, we have a lion, we have, oh, we have another lion in here. We have some window tint. And, oh, oh, no, there's more. There's a panda. There is a finger puppet. Is there anything else? Probably, but we're going to say that's probably good. Okay, I guess let's take this up to the table. I'll try and show you guys. This is my most favorite Christmas decoration ever. 
Get out of the way, heat box. We're busy now. What? Yeah. <laughs> this is going to start like an argument now. Yeah, that's that's definitely the other way around. Uh oh, it must not completely be plugged in yet. Let me take this one out. Oh, 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 I gotta push that. Huh? Oh, no, it does work. Okay. My bad. Okay, so this guy, you turn this on, and then it starts snowing. It's literally that. So it's a constant, like, ta-da, and then it builds up, and it just gets shot back up to the top. And then I can play Christmas music. It's amazing. So, then he started throwing all that. <laughs> then he started throwing all that on the ground. I didn't mean to make your wife upset. No, no, no. No, you're fine. It was the, it was the Lobo. Comment. <laughs> One general question. What is the biggest reason why I have dust in the tent? Uh, just because you're newer. The insulation process is always the hardest to figure out because it's not about the number of times that you clean. It's more about how you install it. So anytime. Whoa. Okay, that, that is the first time I've ever gotten a uh, yen super chat. You, you, Kika, I'm sorry if I screwed up your name, but thank you so much for the super, 500 Japanese yen. That was awesome. I was working tinting in Japan your tips and skills are helpful to me. So I bought NT Cutter. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So these NT Cutter blades and knives. Yeah, those, I'm sure you probably know it though. But yeah, they're uh, Japanese blades and Japanese made knives. They are the best. Um, Olfa is a close second. They're both Japanese brands. We use these on everything. That and the black blades that I have here. So these really, really thin ones, uh, NT Cutter makes honestly the best that I've ever used. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You should be proud of those companies. <laughs> I know you were kidding. So back to Lobo's comment. I know you're kidding, but huh? Oh, she was kidding too, so she got you. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I'm sleeping with her. She's not sleeping with me. Better get used to yen because countries are moving to it. Oh, yeah. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on right now. Everything is just crazy right now. Yup. <laughs> All righty. So this is basically all set at this point. It's just, I'll leave them sitting here. I'll still walk around it and any small things that I see will touch up, but it's mostly all set. Quarter window's not near as bad. Just get one of those little squeegees. Canon. Hang on, let's poke in on some distributor. Let's see if they have it. Oh yeah, and we're gonna be doing the film rack. So, let's put this over here. Wow, that is a big picture to 
take up your home screen. Sorry, it's on. It's on this one. Hello. Okay. Yep. That's good. Um. Yeah. So we're gonna be going over the film rack here pretty soon. This is a really cool thingy, my job, my jigger. Um, this is going to replace the setup that I have over there. Um, I'm really excited to try this thing. So, what are we going to do? Oh, yeah, yeah, the Quarter Pro. I want to see if they have it back in stock. This set. So this was that little squeegee set that I was using. We're out of stock. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I know they're working on getting it back in stock. Let's see, Tint Depot here. Oh, that's not it. I can't even find it on Tint Depot. Maybe they don't have it. Let's see. Mm, it doesn't say out of stock, so they might have it. Hang on, let me pull up my chat here, too. Just push you over there. Uh, let me know when you replace the rack. I'll buy your old setup. Are you in Michigan? I'm not shipping it. It's too big. Um, so, but I can show you exactly what I use. Garage. Uh, what do we call it? Oh, I forgot what the name was. But if you go to like the closet section, it's not like, it's not shelving. It's like wall mounted brackets. It was like dual track brackets or something. Um, but there was one by like Rubbermaid. This wasn't the best option, but this Rubbermaid shelving. Yeah, so this is essentially like what I'm using here. So these screw into the wall. Um, the ones that I bought have a cross beam that goes along the top and then they hang. So you can move these closer or farther together. Um, and then the brackets are just real quick and easy. Yeah, 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 the fast track garage system. So this is a shorter version of what I'm using. Um, but it's all modular and stuff. So the they have these cross beams that go along the top and then things hang from it. So you can hang those down. Um, but the film rack is, is a really cool option that we're gonna check out here really quick. Um, so with this, it's a little hard to tell from the picture, but this is a bracket system. Um, these green pieces, they go into the tint rolls, and then so you literally have the brackets, and then uh, so those plastic pieces, they just shove into the end of the rolls, and you just hang them up on this rack. It's a very simple system. So when you're done with the film roll, you take them out, and then you put them in the new roll, swap it out. What's really convenient about this is that you don't have um, film boxes anymore. You don't need to keep things in a box. Um, so this is really convenient for literally taking off a shelf, dropping it right onto your plotter, putting it right back on, swapping it out. It's gonna be the fastest way to swap out film rolls for your plotter. It's so nice. 
Super, super cool system. So that's exciting. I'm going to try that stuff out. I'm new to tent industry. I watch a lot of your installation videos. Every time it's just, wow, how you never have dust in the tent. You can, I definitely still get dust in my tent. So there's still windows that I have to redo. Um, some streams are better than others. Most of the stuff like this is pretty straightforward. So as long as like, again, squeegee top to bottom, be just very efficient about getting it in there. Um, yeah, and just, you might have something very, very small to touch up, but if you have a lot of things then it needs to be redone. Just label the side of the wall. Um, they actually have a section on the bracket where you can put a label on the bracket itself, but yeah, you could either do one or the other. Because, yeah, otherwise you don't know what anything is. <laughs> but, yeah, you're going to want to put, um, like, the box label or something on it. But it's really, really efficient. I think the other question that I'm probably going to get is, like, aren't your tent rolls going to get dusty? Yeah, they'll get dusty, but that's never an issue with your installation. As soon as you start using the roll, you start knocking dust. Like, I'll explain it later, but... It's not going to put a bunch of dust in your... You don't need to keep a roll in your box to keep your tent job clean. Super chap. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to pronounce your first name. Hoff. I'm just going to say Hoff. <laughs> Thank you for the five. I'm from Germany and new in the tent business. Do you have good tips for beginners every time I mess up tent when I'm shrinking? I never have any good tips just watch lots of videos because that's where I put the most amount of effort into trying to show it like learning how to shrink is very visual visual so hey look it's the rock Moana live action film are you serious heck yeah oh that'll be interesting they should just do a Moana too I'm gonna watch that in a minute that's like, Luke was always listening to those songs. All right, so let me open up another YouTube window. All right, what were we going to do? Um, let's go to my channel. Click on videos. But I would search like window shrinking back windows. There's so many videos. Um, so like stuff like, like this. this. I try and explain it as well as I can, but it's literally like you heat the film up, never push out past where you've shrunk. So wait until it gets closer to the glass and then you have it start forming these, like watch. See, it starts getting closer to the glass and especially here. Wait till it starts laying flat and it starts tightening up a little bit just going across back and forth till you hit about halfway, come back. See how this looks nice and flat? Then you just smooth it out, and then you get to the next section. So I smooth it immediately right down to this, and then I start shrinking this part. And it's just that over and over again. So there's not really any things that I can say. Thank you for the five. There's not really anything that I can say, unfortunately, that'll just make it click. Watch lots of videos, try it, watch more videos. You just film yourself, watch the video back, compare it to what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's tons of videos on that. I'll explain the prep on it. I'll explain how to section everything off. I'll talk about don't shrink out the sides. I just, I don't know what else I can say other than like shrinking's kind of tricky to get the hang of. Just keep watching videos and practicing. Also, use a halfway decent film, too. So, like, if you're using, like, a cheap carbon film, you're going to give yourself problems. That's sometimes... That's what this video is about. What's the importance of shrinking? Well, let's go to TikTok and find out.
Okay, so if you don't shrink a window, um, that's this. This is what happens. You go to press all the fingers out, you squeeze all the bubbles, and you just get these sharp fingers. So then you shrink the film. So then it lays flat on the glass. Go around, shrink the whole thing so it lays flat. See how that looks flat? And then all the bubbles get squeegeed out, and everything lays flat. Otherwise, this happens. Um, so yeah, the last little bit um, before I take off is if you see, go to the Facebook group. So this is another really, really good place. If you're not here, you should be here. Oh, that's not. Try that again. There we go. So this is a really, really big Facebook group. Um, lots of people are talking window tint and talking through problems, uh, opening up their own businesses. Um, see, like there's this one here asking for help, like why did this happen, what's going on? Um, I was trying to figure out what film he was using because for the life of me, sometimes people like to post asking what to do and then they don't actually follow up with anything. So it's kind of hard to help you out. Um, there's this one that I'm gonna do a short video on yeah, like this guy. So, watch this. Yikes. <laughs> why did this happen? I'll show you exactly why this happened, is because he shrunk some of it, and this, right when he gets to the bottom, this is what it looked like before he installed it. See all these big ass fingers and shit? Of course it didn't lay down on the inside. But he shrunk it and that's the thing. It's gotta look smooth on the outside to then lay flush on the inside. So then he took some feedback and then his next attempt looked better. But I need to make a follow up video for him so he understands like, no, no, no. It's just, you still got fingers at the bottom because you didn't shrink it enough. So it doesn't matter if you're putting heat on it, it needs to lay flat. And if it doesn't lay flat, and it, oh, I put heat on it, I just felt like I was putting too much heat, and no, it, it'll take it, it's fine. Shrink it more. But yeah, Facebook group, I do reply videos, and there's lots of other people that are in there helping out, lots of people. I bought a tint plotter, so I'm wondering which program you recommend. Um, check out uh, Plotter Depot. Here, Plotter Software. Nope. Plotter Software. There it is. So Film Cut is what we've been using on stream. I don't think there's any perfect software. Film Cut's gonna be the best software um, for the least amount of money. It's like a hundred bucks a month. Up from there, I hear good things about Core, that's about $150. And then up from there, you have Computer Cut for 200 bucks a month. You can get that through Sun Distributing. So, look at those. Um, at the very least, you can try Film Cut for free, but there is no perfect plotter software, they all have their hiccups. So these did really well though with the quarter windows and everything. I was very happy with those. They made my life easier. All right, so let's shout out some supers. I also got a P. Been watching all your videos for a little while. I'm trying to tip my own windshield here in a bit. Thanks for all the content. You're welcome. Good luck. Windshields are tough. <laughs> uh, Hoff. 
So thank you for all the super chats. Hoff, uh, Yukika, Mike, DC Customs, Burner Account. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Sorry, there would have been fog, but my son's running around. I don't want to blow his ears out. I did turn them on, though, but I, I'm going to turn them on. The sound is low. Oh, do I need to turn up the gain more? That's annoying. Everybody's just got their, like, speakers cranked up. Uh, probably, probably here. Why won't it show me now? Hello. Okay, that should be better. Yeah, I need to turn up the gain. What if your speakers are just quiet? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, it looked a little low. It depends on how close I am, too. I guess I missed the live stream. Yeah, sorry, man. Yeah, we were, we've been live for a few hours now. How long has this been going on? I have dog shit speaker. Uh, maybe I didn't have to adjust my gain. Here, we'll turn it down just a couple. There we go. That should be fine. Somewhere in there. I'm like in the high green. It depends on, I'm looking at the thing bobble. How long does it take you to do one car? Uh, depends on what I do <laughs> and what the car is. So I shoot for under two hours. About two hours and 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah, if it's on stream. Life goes on. Yeah, I, I get annoyed with YouTube notifications. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. It's up to YouTube. Yeah, how long was this one? So this one, yeah, we've been live for two and a half hours. We get, we've had the whole thing done in like probably an hour and a half on this one. So that's cool. I feel better about that. So when I when I was out in a uh, out in the field, I'd shoot for like an hour and a half or less. That was kind of like the goal. At the most, like so, we'd schedule two hours for a car. And then so I try and get it done under that time. And then there would be room for other stuff during the day. So if like an extra set of doors came in or a car was more difficult or if they want to add a windshield, um, we could make that work. Because somebody comes in for a full car and the next thing you know, they want to do the full windshield too and you don't want to turn that money away. They're not going to come back to get it done. They might, but it's way more inconvenient. How long did the Buick take? Uh, it took about an hour and a half. That was with all the extra little quarter windows and stuff. So this back hatch is much easier. It's just a little tedious to cut out, but yeah. So that's good. I feel better now. For I think for a while there, we were taking like four hours with like full windshields and stuff. It's like, oh my God, what is wrong? Fifteen percent carbon looks darker than ceramic. See, I don't, I don't understand that. I don't think so because, like, it's a shade, so it's literally the amount of visible light. It might just be the tone of the film, so it might make you feel like it's darker when it's not. So, like, I've got something on my blazer right now where it's like there's some films that can look more pale than others. Some have a little bit more coloring in the film but it's not a darker VLT or anything. So it just depends on the car. Um, so we did 15 though on the rear. And this one is especially dark because it already had 14% privacy glass. So it's like a little darker than five. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this actually is 5%. <laughs> I still barely hear you. Oh, I don't know then, because I'm doing everything on my end for my speakers. So my volume settings should be pretty good. Okay. Here. So this is basically, okay. We'll do this and then we'll sign off here. So this is going to be, this is also like overcast lighting. Um, so this is 15 on the front. And this is 15 from the inside. And then this is 15 over 14. It's very dark. So you're not going to be able to see it in there, and you'll be able to see like silhouettes and stuff. Oh, yes, it is very dark. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's just dark. And then it just depends on people's film, too. So sometimes. It'll say 15 on the box, but it'll be plus or minus 1 or 2%. So sometimes it'll lean a little darker. Sometimes it'll lean a bit, little bit lighter. All righty. Well, I got to go, though. Thank you guys so much for hanging out today. I appreciate you. We'll see you in the next one. Uh, that'll happen soon. Soon. Yeah, we got some stuff to do. And then I got to film some videos, too. So it'll happen soon. Bye.